Welcome to the second day <clears throat> of the Root and Branch Inclusive Lay Led Synod. I am Colm Holmes, Chair of We Are Church International, and I am also a member of the Root and Branch core team. Root and Branch began in January 2020, before the pandemic. We were responding to journalist Joanna Moorhead's challenge in the tablet that the Catholic Church needed a synod that starts with women, rather than tagging them on the end or ignoring them altogether. Very soon, as the name suggests, we understood that we needed to look at all areas of reform in the church. As we have been joined by more and more people, it has become clear that Root and Branch is not a single issue movement. Women may have started it, but it would not end there. The pandemic lockdown and the rise in online forums allowed us to embark in October 2020 towards an inclusive lay-led synod. We have listened to speakers from all over the world, both online and quietly in correspondence. We have been open to, and we have actively sought out opinion from all sections of the church. We have become, we have been accompanied by prayer and we trust the guiding inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We hope that our thinking has matured and deepened, that we have become more inclusive at the same time as learning to be more bravely challenging. For months, we have been preparing the Bristol text to reform. It is a document that embodies at least some of the discoveries we have made. It exists both in a readily accessible form, which you will see this evening, and in much more complex learned forms for those who want to explore more deeply. If you've been with us on our journey, you will have contributed in forums and breakout groups to the Bristol text, and we thank you for that. The Bristol text to reform is intended to give ordinary Catholics across the world the reassurance that there are changes we can make in our practice that are in keeping with the best of Catholic tradition and have the endorsement of deep, pastorally sensitive and well-informed thinkers and theologians. It also offers practical and often challenging visions for the church, calling it to be Christ-like in its structures, its thinking and its practice. So this week is the culmination of our year-long journey. We begin this evening with the second of four presentations by our international panels of thinkers of the Bristol text. text. This evening's panel has been preparing that part of the Bristol text that considers embracing diversity. On Tuesday, we're online at 7 p.m. for Rethinking Moral Theology. And on Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. for Sharing Authority. You'll have to forgive us for the different times. They are because we have speakers joining us from all around the world. We'll bring all these times up again at the end and you can find them on our website. Then also do join us in prayer for the Synod on Thursday evening between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. On Friday midday, we begin our wonderful weekend firework display of speakers, both online and in Bristol, led by Mary McAleese, Helena Kennedy and James Carroll. We will end next Sunday with a celebration of word and communion, followed by lunch in an agape of inclusion. So tonight, so to tonight, the format for this evening is simple. We will introduce our panel and they will discuss the four short form statements they have come up with. There will be more learned backup documents, of course. Our short statements tonight are designed to be clear and straightforward and easy to manage in this medium. 
At the end, we will have, we hopefully, about 30 minutes for the panel to answer your questions. Please email rbsynodchat at gmail.com to submit questions. That's rbsynodchat at gmail.com. You can email there at any time to submit questions. My colleagues, Penelope Middlebow and Mary Ring will be asking the questions you send in. Naturally, with hundreds of audience members, we will only be able to tackle a sample, but there will be a survey after the Synod where we'd welcome your thoughts and contributions. For now, let me introduce your chair for this evening. Ruby Almeida was born in Jodhpur, India. She was brought up with an Almeida identity that was both strongly Catholic and Indian from an early age. After moving to England and attending a Catholic school, she embarked on a decades long career in the media industry. This included making documentaries for the Indian Space Organization, working primarily with the community sector, NGOs and colleagues in India under her own video production company and being senior lecturer in film and broadcast at London Metropolitan University. Ruby has worked for many years on LGBTQ plus rights. She was chair of Quest for eight years and is the co-chair of the global network of Rainbow Catholics. She set up Rainbow Catholic India and Bridge and Embrace, the first LGBT groups in India and is on the LGBT plus Catholics Westminster Pastoral Council. Ruby works for Landings, a program to support baptized Catholics who once distant from their faith, now wish to return to it. Ruby, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Colm. Um, and, and thank you to everybody at Root and um, uh, uh, Branch. <laughs> Root and Branch, sorry, I'm getting confused with the group I set up in India. Root and Branch, for this amazing, amazing uh, event that you all have organized. It's just phenomenal uh, to see what uh, the engagement that was there yesterday and, and today and in the next few days and certainly when we meet up in Bristol. So, you know, I'm actually thrilled to be here uh, and to have these amazing uh, colleagues and friends of mine on this panel to talk about diversity, what is it and how does it impact on our lives and how do we live our lives in as many diverse ways as possible and particularly for our church to recognize uh, and to uh, accept us as who we are. Um, so um, as Colm said, uh, we, we're going to um, look at uh, the various uh, pan, um, uh, texts that have been written and certainly the presentations each of our presenters is going to do and afterwards Please think about the questions you want to ask um, and then please send them through um, in, in the link that Colm um, mentioned earlier. Um, and what I'm going to do now is, um, if the first uh, screen can come up, this first slide, I shall start introducing the first speaker. Thank you for that. Thank you. So, uh, the Bristol text. It's about affirming diversity, which is an imperative for attesting the dignity, the sanctity of every form of life, valuing the uniqueness and contribution of each person. This calls for a radical reimagining of the way of being in church, as it has become predominantly a hierarchical institution, structured on an all male leadership. Um, so this is going to be a read uh, a pre uh, presented by Kucharani Abraham from Kerala, uh, India, my favorite part of India. Um, really, really happy to have Kucharani with us. So Dr. Kucharani Abraham is an Indian feminist theologian, a researcher, a writer, trainer on issues related to gender, sexuality, spirituality, and ecology. She engages with the academia and the grassroots in striving for a liberative praxis. 
She is active in the Indian Christian Women's Movement, an autonomous ecumenical movement of Christian women committed to justice concerns in India, and as well is involved with the Indian Women's Theologian Forum, an association of Indian Catholic feminist theologians, and serves as the Vice President of the Indian Theological Association. And she's the executive uh, is on the executive committee of the World Forum of Theology and Liberation, representing Asia. So I'll hand you over to Kucharani, who's going to talk about the notions of diversity. Thank you, Kucharani. Thank you very much, Ruby, and wonderful to be here with you all. So a very good evening and greetings to all of you from Kerala in India. I feel very happy and honored to be sharing this panel at this Root and Branch Inclusive Synod, which is certainly an important landmark in the evolutionary story of the church. All the work that has gone into the preparation of the synod and finally actualizing it these days is a clear indication that we, the Christian faithful, are coming of age as ecclesiastical citizens. This indeed is a proud moment for the church that in realizing this inclusive synod, diversity is already being manifested in the ecclesiastical body. By bringing in diverse voices from below, into the thinking processes of what it means to be church in the world today, it is a moment of ecclesiogenesis. I'm borrowing an expression from the noted liberation theologian, Leonardo Ball, since the church is coming into being in a new way. I take diversity as the ground for building the church anew. But someone may ask, what is so new about it? Is not diversity a hallmark of the church in its Catholicity that brings together people from diverse cultures under one faith? Surely the Catholic Church is universal as a religious institution that has made its presence felt in the diverse geographical and sociocultural contexts across the world. This is true at the level of membership and global representation. While this ground reality is acknowledged, the question is, how can diversity be a lived experience at every level of ecclesiastical life? This brings the question of inclusion into our discussion. I'm sure all would agree with me that diversity and inclusion are two sides of the coin. Acknowledging diversity is futile if it does not find expression in the inclusion of people with diverse identities and talents into the functioning of any organization, whether it is in the social, cultural, political, economic, or religious realms of life. This demands moving beyond binaries and dated notions that are historically conditioned on how life ought to be organized. Embracing diversity entails accepting life in its fluidity and drawing in wisdom from persons and sources, however different they may be. This is a crucial milestone in the growth process of an individual or community since beauty and wholeness becomes a reality only by including or bringing together diverse voices, elements, and their contributions. The greatest lessons on the interplay of diversity and inclusion for generating wholeness, we have from nature that is all around us. Creation reveals to us that diversity is the fundamental law of life, since plurality is the foundational code of existence. This law of nature is manifest where every being finds its space to grow and live in greater fullness and productivity. 
From the biblical perspective, the creation story gives the theological significance of this law of life by attesting to the fact that everything created is endorsed as good in the eyes of God. Therefore, embracing diversity becomes imperative for affirming the dignity and sanctity of every form of life. I believe that in manifesting diversity as an existential norm, nature makes it evident that every human organization needs to evolve respecting this grounding principle in life, which is the foundation, which is foundational for promoting mutuality and sustainable relationships. However, the problematic arises in the human way of dealing with diversity, when difference is ordered hierarchically in any socio-cultural setting. I come from the Indian subcontinent and the negative consequences of the hierarchical structuring of difference is clearly evident in my society. The Indian social fabric is a mosaic of different cultures, ethnicities, religions, languages, and the like. However, the beauty of this social constitution is distorted when diversity gets organized hierarchically, and this leads to systemic inequalities. The class, caste, and gender hierarchy is characteristic of Indian society, and its intersectionalities testify to this fact. While this is being increasingly deconstructed in the secular realm, in the religious domain, tradition continues to play a decisive role with its hegemonic hold on people's lives. And the church is not an exception to this. I shall this explain this on a personal note. I was born into a traditional Catholic family belonging to the Siro Malabar Rite, one of the three Catholic rites in India. This church community claims its origins to the belief that St. Thomas the Apostle came to India in the first century and converted Brahmins, the social group that has appropriated for itself the highest position on the caste hierarchy. I had accepted and internalized the caste and gender hierarchies of this church community uncritically and as divinely ordained until I got exposed to the lives of people from diverse socio-economic and cultural settings of Indian context as a young adult. And I realized how impoverished and stunted the growth of an individual or community can become if it is stuck on a constructed identity furnished by those who hold the reins of power. This led me to deconstruct the fabricated past identity that had gone into my own making along with its privileges. It also meant unlearning and freeing me from the gender consciousness consequent to being at the lowest rungs of the hierarchical ladder that was allotted to women in my community. Growing out of this hierarchical consciousness, was the fruit of a spiritual awakening. And this became the turning point in my life. I think this spiritual awakening is happening to many people who decide to live their Christian commitment as a community. And so I believe that it is time that the church evolves, embracing the meaningfulness of diversity and inclusion in a non-hierarchical manner. In the secular world today, diversity is promoted for the fact that it expands innovation, creativity, and productivity in the life of an organization. It is asserted that diversity matters because it brings a broad collection of experiences, perspectives, backgrounds, and viewpoints to the discussion, leading to better decision-making. Today, more than ever, organizational leaders are called to focus on embracing the strengths of a diverse membership and inc incorporating inclusion strategies. The gendered and racialized power equations that have defined organizational relationships 
are being increasingly challenged. Recent developments in the diversity question also stress on the heterogeneity of group differences and challenge the view that takes difference as essentialist. It points to the importance of capturing the subtleties and nuances of difference. Equality based on difference has become the key word of all committed, all who are committed to justice, human rights, and liberation. And this informs also the struggle to establish right relationships with the earth and all its creatures. This is the 21st century world in which the church finds itself today. How is the church engaging in a constructive conversation with this aspect of the modern world? The church's commitment to engage in dialogue with the modern world was already pronounced around 50 years ago in Gaudium et Spes, one of the key documents of the Second Vatican Council. Would the official church pay heed to this cry for inclusion by diverse groups of Christian faithful across the globe? Would inclusivity, which is about honoring the right to equal opportunities in spite of differences, become a reality in every aspect of the life and mission of the church? Embodying the vision of the reign of God initiated by Jesus Christ, in the church entails upholding diversity on the principles of inclusion, equality, and justice. I am deeply convinced of this. This calls for a radical reimagination of the way of being church as it has become predominantly a hierarchical institution structured on an all-male leadership. Embracing diversity in the church implies that people, irrespective of their ethnicity, race, class position, caste identity, gender, and sexual orientation, have the opportunity to realize their vocation and mission in the church and as church. Every aspect of ecclesiastical life, including ministries, services, and leadership structures, need to be open to engage spiritual persons who are proficient to realize the mission of Christ. Then the church will become once again a sign and sacrament of unity in an increasingly fragmented and unequal world as we have it today. This will become possible if the church can take radical steps towards realizing the theological significance of equality as noted in Galatians 3.28, that in, in the ecclesiastical body, there are no distinctions between status, race, or gender, but all are one in Christ Jesus. This ecclesiogenesis is already happening at the grassroots where Sophia, the spirit, is at work. Is the church ready to be birthed by her once again in this third millennium? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kucharani. Um, you, you touched on so many really important issues that I'm sure the audience uh, who have been uh, watching and listening have, have started coming up with lots of questions that they'd like to ask you. So uh, please, uh, everybody, uh, please formulate your questions uh, and, and send them to, to us on rbsynodchat at gmail.com. Um, um, I'm going to um, speedily go on to our next speaker, um, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll do all the speakers and, and their pre uh, presentations, uh, and then, then we'll come back uh, and uh, do uh, the um, questions and answers. So, um, um, so now, we are going to go on to the next speaker and uh, we're going to talk about um, gender um, and, and, and sex um, 
And so the, the church's teaching on, on sex and gender is confused uh, and it's contradictory. Uh, there is in effect no public policy. Male, female binaries are institutionalized through the historical understandings of family life, natural law. Transgender individuals challenge sex gender binary norms. But scientifically, we know that sex gender is complex. And that we also establish our own identities through the stories we tell. So our, our next speaker, our next uh, person who's going to present is Claire Jenkins from England. So we've uh, come far away from India, much closer to home, to England. Um, Dr. Claire Jenkins is a trans woman and a convert to the Catholic Church. She was married with four children until in 1999 she transitioned from male to female at the age of 50. Prior to this, Claire was a deputy head teacher of a secondary school. Her PhD from University of Sheffield researched the effects of transitioning on the family members of transsexual people. Actively in, uh, involved in the pastoral care of LGBT Catholics in her diocese, she also supports the LGBT Muslim asylum seekers and refugees, some of who have become her close friends and, and family in effect. And she's also an advisor to the Catholic bishops of England and Wales about transgender issues. Currently, Claire has a senior fellowship at Margaret Beaufort Institute in Cambridge, where she's researching schools and transgender and gender non-conforming young people and developing it into a research project over the next few years. So uh, let me hand you over to Claire who is going to talk uh, about very important issues close to her heart on which she's a great expert. So thank you Claire, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I share my screen please? Uh, yeah, yeah, you have rights to screen share now. Just... Right. Can people see that? Thank you. Yeah, if, if you, you, that's right, just start the slideshow, that's right. Right, we'll start from the beginning. Yeah, that's good. Um, what I want to talk about is based on the biblical um, passage one, uh, Genesis one twenty seven, male and female, he created them. And uh, as a sociologist, I want to give a perspective on the transgender experience for the Catholic Church. Um, Ruby's told you that, so I'll move on quickly. And thank you for inviting me, Root and Branch, to speak today. Right. Um, again, I'll go quickly through this slide because Ruby's highlighted the main points. Uh, I want to talk about Catholic controversy, controversy and confusion, terminology, family life, natural law or institutional sexuality, heterosexuality, what is biological sex, feminism and transgender, gender non-binary or queer, and transgender identity stories, and then end up with what I think the discussion should be in the Catholic Church. Um, terminology, any, any good talk on transgender issues will introduce you to terminology. Now, my particular research was used in transsexual people, which is a term that's not often used today. But what I mean by transsexual is people who transition from male to female or MTF or female to male FTM or are 
in medical terms classified as gender dysphoric or simply in modern parlance trans. Um, however, transgender or trans is a broad term and um, uh, gender non-binary or queer, I'll, I'll explain later on. Um, but essentially a transgender person crosses the conventional boundaries of gender in clothing and in presenting themselves. And a minority, smaller number of trans people might go as far as to have multiple surgical procedures to be fully bodily reassign, reassigned to their um, preferred uh, gender, gender sex role. Um, transgender people in reality often have very complex gender identities and may move from one trans category to another over time. Now, the Catholic confusion goes back quite a long way. Um, however, there's no public policy stated by the Catholic Church. I believe there is a secret policy, but um, the bishops, that seems to be at the bishop's level. Um, but let's go back to 692 AD, the Council of Trullo forbid cross-dressing by both women and men. In 1431, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake by the Inquisition because she dressed as a man, yet in 1920, she was canonized as Saint Joan. I know there's a lot more about Joan of Arc and her visions as well, but I've just extracted uh, this uh, gender, fact that she transgressed and transgress gender norms of her time. Um, now, Pope Benedict um, took a particular interest in transgender issues and suggested that there is a need to save mankind from the destructive blurring of gender roles, and it's as important as saving the rainforests. Quite a powerful statement. And Pope Francis followed on from that, um, saying that gender theory was apoc apocalyptic, um, equivalent to nu nuclear war or even Nazism, and the heralds that destroy death, disfigure the face of man and woman, destroying creation. So certainly um, state statements have been expressed at the top of this church, which are very anti-trans. However, in 2015, Pope Francis welcome, welcomes a transgender man at the Vatican. Um, so what I've shown on this slide really is how policy and confusion seem to happen within the church over time. Um, now, this is important when you're talking about um, the church and trans people. Uh, familiar life, I call it. Um, but the church refers to the family as a biological father and mother who produce children. And that's simply it from the church perspective. Sociologically, we understand uh, modern research understands families uh, which are characterized by openness, inclusion, and tidiness, and the reality of family relationships. What families do is the important, what they function as is the important issue as far as, far as uh, social research is concerned. And I'm sure you, you, you'll understand that um, messiness um, is human reality as well. Now, even though the reality is mixed, the original ideas remain quite fixed in public life and the church's understanding. Now, natural law, which is a church, a theological term, or in a social term, institutional heterosexuality. And from my perspective, I see them as more or less similar, very similar. Um, and basically the fundamental things is the binary of male, female, 
on a notice, I put the dominant one first. So males are considered, are in reality, socially more dominant than female. Masculinity, femininity, heterosexuality, and homosexuality. Um, and they reinforce even today through marriage, family, politics, religion, work, education, medicine, and the media. Both in society and in politics, relationships or relations of the body and reproduction are the most important relationships. Which is surprising that values commonly associated with the mind, the heart and the soul are not considered as important. And I would have thought any church or religious organization would be more um, concerned about these values rather than um, the physical body. Right, um, challenging the social pattern of natural law and institutional heterosexuality. Well, trans people mess up this schema, um, the social pattern, because the unusual relationship between male, masculine and female feminine is disrupted. And transsexual people uh, need to be constantly vigil if they are to survive, because trans women are supposed to look like women and trans men like men. Now, this is the controversial area. Well, it's all controversial, actually. Uh, what is biological uh, sex? Now, I'm trying to bring us up to modern scientific social understandings. Uh, historically, um, and even today, in normal practice or usual practice, when a baby is born, the presence of a penis or a vagina and labia indicate which of the two binary sex the baby is. Um, as, the, as the baby grows into an adult or through puberty, uh, body hair distribution and breasts develop and uh, differentiate male and female. Um, if you get a bit look inside the body more closely, you'll discover there's ovaries or testes which distinguish, and then um, more sophisticated again, uh, levels of estrogen and testosterone. Remember that all humans tend to have both estrogen and testosterone circulating in their bodies, but for females, for example, estrogen tends to be much, levels tend to be much higher. Now I'll put this next issue in red because this is where um, science stops in a sense. Um, uh, sex might be something to do with genetics or individual cells or even the brain. Now research in both these areas is not conclusive, so there is ambiguity there. Um, and also we need to, as we all intuitively understand, I think human organisms actively evolved from fertilization until death and no single academic or clinical discipline provides the best way of understanding human sex and gender identity. Now, the media won't be aware of that. Feminism. Um, not all about. Uh, Janice Raymond is an interesting character. Janice Raymond was religious in the States in the 70s, up to the late 70s, and um, she stated quite categorically in a PhD thesis that um, it's impo biologically impossible to change sex because of the chromosomes. Uh, males are XY, females are XX. So a male who transition or even has bodily um, changes is still going to have XY and still has a female still have XX. But of course, science has uncovered that there are different patterns of chromosomes, they are simplistic. And I believe there's about, 100 and different, uh, about 102 different types of patterns um, discovered at present. Um, 
And going back to Janice Raymond, she makes this biological fact, but she also says the male to females don't have the social experience of patriarchy. Okay. Um, and radical femi feminists will follow Janice Raymond, but that does not match transsexual lived daily experience. And other feminists are more supportive and trans theorists, and they argue that trans people challenge gender, sex, and sexuality. Judith Butler is a very significant character, an American philosopher and gender theorist. And Judith um, argues that at birth, or even before birth, using ultrasound, a doctor or midwife sexes the baby, what I've been saying earlier on, decides if it's male or female. And then following that, <coughs> Girling or boying is done daily to establish gender identity. Girling and boying are Judith Butler's terms for the social processes occurring. And therefore, she sees sex and gender as a social construction. However, transsexual people don't rec recognize natally assigned gender identity all the transsexual people I studied experienced distress and tension, and they'll get recognition if they accept the natal, natal sex, gender, or ostracism, or even violence and discrimination if they don't accept the natally assigned gender and start transition. Just a brief digression onto gender non binary or queer. Um, now, as far back as I can trace, this started um, some not that long ago, but in Anglo-American society and amongst more affluent young people. And uh, they gender non-binary is defined as they don't have a gender, or they non-binary or gender queer. So in essence, they refuse in the binary. Um, and some people, including me, think it has something to do with the socio-political ideology driven by patriarchal understanding of male dominance and by an excessive fixation with gender issues within the media and celebrity culture. Um, that's very controversial, but it's just a hypothesis. It might or might not be true research will prove whether that's right or not. Um, and for even some people, it's primarily a personal or individual choice. Um, and the Pope has said it could be driven by neoliberal market emphasis on enlightenment individualism. And he's quoted as saying, oh, what's happening now, can I, oops. Only by losing the fear of being different can we free, be freed of self-centeredness and self-absorption. Sex education should help young people to accept their own bodies and avoid the pretension to cancel out sexual difference because no, one no longer knows how to deal with it. So that's Pope Francis from Amoris Letitia. Um, right. We establish our identities through the stories we tell, all of us do. And an identity only becomes a big issue when it's in crisis, particularly for sex and gender for transsexual people, pre-transition, as I've said earlier. This is a story, quick story of Nigel, a transsexual man, female to male. My biological sex is female, and obviously I never quite identified with that since I was young. It took a while to get my head around who I am, where I was going with things, and think after, I think after seven years, I found myself in a bit more happier place since I've transitioned to be a man. Um, and we tell our identity, all of us tell our identity stories to others. So it's a social thing again. 
and it emphasizes our human interdependency. But um, often transsexual bodies or even trans people's bodies don't reflect what they feel inside. And as I've said earlier on, we need to be careful or, or we're going to experience um, violence and discrimination. Um, I think I'll skip this slide for all speed. Right, let's have a look at the discussion. Uh, clearly, transsexual people violate the traditions of Abrahamic religion. That's um, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, since they transgress the normative relationship between biologically sex body and the socially performed gender. Um, and the church can now, my experience is that there are very few people in the church hierarchy who understand what gender theory is. They quote it quite a lot, but it's a bit like a straw man. But um, gender theory essentially emanates from Judith Butler. And um, as I said, there's different understandings. So the church needs to consider this uh, more deeply. Um, and certainly, not only in the church, but right across uh, medicine, more research is needed about gender, non-binary and gender queer. There's very little known. Um, so the church needs to think clearly about that again. Um, and as I've said, so often when trans people transgress the sex gender norms, violence ensues, so the, does the church want to be complicit in this violence? And um, Amoris Laetitia, that the church needs to respond pastorally to diverse family forms. And in conclusion, things the church might do then is move, certainly transgender people are marginalized and move it, to, as Pope Francis often says, move it from the peripheries into the center um, and it may hold its traditional teaching in tension with the pastoral situation of transgender people and their families. And they might take the opportunity to discern what God is calling us to do about this complex problem. And finally, it's an opportunity for the church to follow Jesus, showing mercy, tenderness and love. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you very much for that, Claire. Uh, as, as always, you leave us sometimes with our heads spinning at all the things that we don't know, that we need to know and understand. There's so much there, so much, uh, so much complexity in, in all the issues, the nuanced and the huge uh, you know, sense of understanding about transition about you know uh, a trans person so thank you very very much for that Claire. always always fascinating okay um so we'll go on to the next text uh and i apologize uh, for the previous slide um which i couldn't see fully so i'm going to read this time so i've got a better site um so uh, this is about redefining we. Um, many Catholics, uh, for many Catholics, evangelization implies being truth tellers in one sphere and liars in another, making available an objective gospel that does not touch who we are. Our bodies and our spirits long for truthfulness and come alive when we allow them to bear witness to it. That means the construction of the new Catholic we depends on all of us learning to preach the gospel in the first person, singular and plural. We learn to see ourselves in our differently aged, differently abled, differently gendered, differently bodied, differently sexually oriented, differently colored, differently tongued neighbor. Our similarity, not our difference, 
is what counts. So that's uh, what James Allison is going to talk about. Uh, now James is currently in Mexico, but lives in Madrid, is, but is from England, so he's truly an international person. James Allison is a Catholic priest, author, and theologian. He studied with the Dominicans in Oxford and the Jesuits in Brazil. His principal work has been in promoting the fecundity of systemic, sorry, system, systematic and biblical theology of the thought of the late French thinker René Girard. 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 He is also known for attempting to speak Christian as a gay man, one of the few in his profession to do so openly. He has lived and worked as a preacher, teacher, retreat leader in many countries worldwide, and especially in North and South America. He currently lives in Madrid, where he is owned by the French bulldog, Nicholas. So, we hand you over to James. Thank you, James. Thank you. <clears throat> can you can you see me and hear me? <clears throat> yeah, it's all fine, James. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so here I am in Mexico City, thanking thanking you, Ruby, very much indeed, and thanking you, Root and Branch, very much for having invited me. And I'm very glad that our panel title was in change was changed to Learning Inclusivity. I really didn't want to speak to as part of a panel on diversity. It's not my thing at all. To be clear, I don't fault the Root and Branch organizers for having wanted to raise the topic. I hate it that the reality of the situation we are in as church is that the way I'm thought to be interesting is because some of you think that over the years, I've spoken since as a gay man. This frustrates me. My passion from my first book, Knowing Jesus, to my most recent book, The Introduction to the Christian Faith for Adults, called Jesus the Forgiving Victim, to my most recent web initiative, prayingeucharistically.com, is evangelization. Working out a fresh way, one that is livable, prayable, and preachable, to make sense of the gospel such that it can be shared, and such that we can build Eucharistic communities which are learning to be signs of the kingdom. If anyone were to ask me which part of any synodal group or church project more widely, I would like to be part of, I would unhesitatingly say evangelization. That's my thing, as preaching is my passion. But it is in fact my fault that such an invitation is very unlikely to be forthcoming, for some time at least. My fault that I get instead invitations like this one, to speak as in some way representative of an issue I'm not really interested in. For all of which there's a simple enough reason. I came to the conclusion over 25 years ago that my primary vocation, that of preacher of the gospel of grace, was incompatible with complicity in the violent dishonesty that goes along with the closet. In other words, I realized that I couldn't be a truth teller in one sphere and a liar in another. Or rather, of course, that like everyone, I could be and was both of those things. However, I knew that I had to allow the truth and grace of the one to start slowly to melt away in me the violent dishonesty of the other. Because otherwise the reverse would be true. The closet would form the gospel, imposing the structure of what can and can't be said. And what I found out over the intervening years is that my decision was unacceptable. The precondition for being involved in any form of publicly recognized Catholic evangelization is that you do not attempt first person discourse as an L, G, B, or T person. That first person discourse that Claire has just talked about as well. Though of course, sometimes people claiming to be X, one or other of those things are briefly given platforms and then hung out to dry by the dishonest opportunists who promote them. But mostly the precondition is that you make available an objective, apodictic gospel that doesn't touch who you are, 
and above all, that you don't challenge the preaching <coughs> of those for whom LGBT people are enemies necessary for the construction of whatever form of sacred boundary they are projecting. It is for this reason that over the years I have had slowly and with many ups and downs to try to work out what it means to preach, to share the gospel publicly to witness to Jesus in the first person as a gay man with all the complications of my sinfulness as well as the sexual, relational and psychological incompetence and immaturity that are part of my baggage as they are that of many other gay men of my generation. But without too much fear of what will come to light, things of which I'm ashamed and things of which I'm not ashamed, but of which some would think I should be, since I know I am loved. Because of course, it's only as you allow yourself to become the person who you are, that you find yourself loved. It is Jesus's loving you even where you would be at your most ashamed, that enables you to relax into being loved. And it is as you relax that you come to know you are loved. And it is as you come to know that you are loved, that you begin to be able to preach the gospel that is coming to life in you, rather than some theological soundbite or ideology to which you must hold for professional reasons with all the no-go areas it imposes. And this is really the only interest the matter of diversity has for me, its relationship to evangelization. And that means its relationship to the possibility of first-person discourse in Christian preaching. I dislike much usage of the word diversity. It comes across as a lazy catch-all of minority groups being pandered to by some imagined majority group who are supposedly learning to be kind to people who are different. That may be appropriate when it comes to employment law or health and safety provisions. But when it comes to being Catholic, it is our similarity, not our difference, that is important. It is when we see ourselves in the differently aged, the differently abled, the differently gendered, differently bodied, differently sexually oriented, differently colored, differently tongued, differently moneyed, differently rooted in any specific country or town, that we are enriched by each other. Whether we are in a majority or a minority in any specific area, and we are, all of us, in both majorities and minorities, in intertwining dimensions of our lives, interactions, and conversations. But that means that the construction of the new we, which is what Catholicism is all about, the we out of every people and nation and tribe and tongue, depends on all of us learning to preach the gospel in the first person. The first person plural forming the first person singular, and the first person singular reforming and keeping alive the first person plural. And here I will grudgingly concede that a panel on diversity might have made sense. For what it means in real terms is that there are some of us who have had to do an enormous amount of spade work in order to reach a place of being able to talk in the first person. Because of this, we might have something to offer to those who have not so far had to do that much spade work. For some are beginning to realize that the first person plural, the Catholic we, which formed and lubricated their first person singular, is not real. And that the Catholic first person singular, they were happy to swim around as, is no longer fit for service. Furthermore, I guess it is clear to those here, those attending Root and Branch Synod, that the official we of church authority lives in a sycophantic self-reinforcing bubble and throws around the word they in a largely delusional manner. When church authority talks about women or trans people or homosexual persons, often enough what they claim to respect are in fact Gnostic fictions of their own imagination. 
the real people concerned are told how, a priori, they aren't what they think they are. Yet it is church authorities' own self-referential concoctions whose gear wheels have no traction with reality, as indeed many of that authority's own members will tell you off the record, of course. Thus, if there is to be a teaching authority rather than a maintaining ideology because we're too frightened to actually learn and become teachers authority, then learning how to say we, inclusively but not invasively, and you, tentatively and with real interest, and I, occasionally and with gratitude, quiet delight, and occasionally with penitential tears, is very much going to be part of the synodal process. So as that process gets underway, have we yet reached the stage where the various stones that the builders rejected are able to find their way into beautifying the head of the corner? If we have, it's because a huge work of conscience has been going on. People in each of the categories too lazily described as diverse, having had to sift through many things on the way to becoming a tentative first person singular. One that's not in rivalry with, but helps glorify the new first person plural, the holy city that is coming down upon us. Typically, we've had to work through the shame of the space we found ourselves occupying, learning to distinguish between things that are sinful and things that are part of creation, not shameful at all, but potential bearers of glory. In order to do this, we've probably had to discover something central to the Catholic understanding of conscience, which is that it is above all inherently related to truth, to what is real. It's an abiding puzzle to me that Catholic apologists have been unable to use the coming out of gay and lesbian people or the delight and serenity in who they really are of transgendered people as one of the more evident signs of the truth of classic Catholic teaching concerning humans being inherently aligned with the truth of our creator. Humans really aren't in infinitely malleable, morally relativist, and corporally different. Our bodies and our spirits long for truthfulness and come alive with zest and song when we allow them to bear witness to it. One of the privileges of being LGBT and Catholic is having had to wrestle hard with what seemed commonsensical in our upbringing in order to live in the truth and to be made free. It's not that scientific knowledge trumps religion for us. It's that our properly religious conscience has been helped by science to defang the strictures of the sacred and come to life in the reality of creation discovered as holy. Thanks to conscience, we're able to filter out the remnants of the deteriorated we which precedes all of us and which gives us to be, however partially and unsurely, and to be retrofitted by the new we which is coming upon us as church and turning us into distinct but similar eyes who enrich each other with the tales we are learning to share. First person accounts of having been stretched painfully into reality by the indwelling of the spirit of Christ, who was not ashamed to find glory where we dared not imagine it. Of having learned to distinguish between the powerful traps of sacred seeming violence and the weak and gentle draw of holy breath. Of being given fragile belonging in the midst of no belonging sons and daughters coming into freedom as we learn to receive our inheritance. Will the synodal way have room 
for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, James. Uh, as always, you you leave us with questions and challenges, which is really really important. Uh, and and all the things you say and all the comments you make, uh, in a way, they almost make your heart sing, you know, uh, and, and the mind about what what it is we can and should be doing, rather than what we're not doing, uh, and always asking us to look at things in a more creative and positive way. So, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I, I'm, 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 I understand that we're running late. Uh, we're running over time, but uh, you know, all these conversations and presentations are so important. So we really wanted to give it as much time as we could. So, so thank you very much for that. So we'll go on to the next one, the last part, <clears throat> uh, not the least, certainly the last part, the most important of all uh, the conversations we're having. Uh, <clears throat> and this is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, about accountability and apology. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, accountability means taking responsibility for the ways in which our beliefs, theology, practices have contributed to the dehumanization and persecution <clears throat> of many people who are seen as other. What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Genesis 4, 10. The words spoken to Cain after killing his brother Abel point to the critical need for accountability, restitution and transformation as we seek to restore the dignity and rights of all persons as equal. Then the harm done can be acknowledged in ways that include the participation of those harmed creating, affirming, equality, expressing theologies where no one is excluded and all are equal. And so this is um, uh, uh, going to lead into a presentation by Nantando, who is in South Africa. So Dr. Nantanda Hadebi is a woman theologian based in Johannesburg, South Africa, and has recently been appointed as international coordinator for Side by Side Gender Justice Organization, um, attached to We Will Speak Out South Africa. Her membership includes the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians, Future Church, and Catholic Women Speak Preach. Nantando hosts a weekly radio program on Radio Veritas, is a facilitator on an ecumenical program called Forsisa that brings church leaders into dialogue with LGBTIQ persons. She recently published as co-editor a book entitled A Time Like No Other, COVID-19 in Women's Voices. I'll hand you over to Nintendo. Thank you, Nintendo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruby. And I also want to thank the fellow panelists. And I know that we're running out of time. So I'm going to try to capture the essence uh, of what I will be, I'll be saying. Um, I think I will start off by looking at uh, theology itself. Uh, the theology of God and humanity. Uh, and, and my argument for that is to say that at the very essence of our theology and our faith is diversity. And so these dehumanizing theologies that have excluded the family of God from the table actually disrupt our entire theological thinking. So I just want to begin with those theologies and then move on uh, to describe how, you know, the violence starts with exclusion and how the need for accountability requires a rethinking, even of the catechism, the way in which people are described. So I'll just quickly go through. So I wanted to just give that overview, that theological overview, just to give you the context of why I've, I've uh, decided to, to, to go this way. Um, so let me just move there. Yeah, so I said that um, I would look at the theology of diversity 
right from the faith, the Christian faith, is that God is Trinity. That's diversity right there. The diversity of creation, the diversity of the church. So it is the failure to embrace the fundamentals of our own faith and to support ideologies of violence and oppression, sexism, racism, homo, transphobia, ableism, classism. And then to look at accountability, holding ourselves accountable and responsibility justice making. So if we look at the theology of God, the Christian monotheism is represented by the Trinity, that there's one God in three persons and they are different. The spirit is not the son, nor the father, the son, nor the son, the spirit. So right there in the very essence of our faith is an understanding of a God who exists in difference and yet in oneness. And that oneness doesn't blur the differences. So if we are to extract diversity from our faith, we wouldn't have the God that we believe in. There's no hierarchy here. Um, you know, the, as I said, it's, it's, it's part of uh, the center of our faith. And the, and the mystical theology, uh, which is uh, a theology that is inclusive of both, both male and female and comes from spaces of, un of union with God, of a, a love relationship with God, presents us an inclusive Trinitarian theology. Um, and so, and, and so I want to, so I think I've looked at that. I wanted to look at the quotation uh, from Julian of, of, of Norwich and to say that it disrupts this gendering of God and locking God into these, uh, you know, these he, uh, she, these just these um, prisons that we have locked God in. And she says, I contemplated the work of all the blessed Trinity in which contemplation I saw and understood these three properties, the property of fatherhood, the property of motherhood and the property of Lordship. So right there, you know, the greatest violence, which is the violence of exclusion from the image of God is addressed by mystics. And their experience of God allowed them to realize that in, in God, there are gender reversals. There's fluidity in the understanding of the personhood of God. And I think that, you know, I wanted to mention that because when we, when, when, we, when we go to the center of our faith and we look at what is it that we believe in, then we see that the inclusiveness of all of creation, the diversity of human beings. And she says, I saw and understood that the high might of the Trinity is our father, the deep wisdom is our mother and the great love is our Lord. So again, this kind of uh, inclusiveness that we see in the very nature of God. Uh, is something I think that the mystical tradition, which already disrupts, is, is a gift uh, to us as we try to, you know, to understand. And then the feminist theologian uh, describes, you know, the relationship with the, within the Trinity that it embodies the qualities of mutuality, reciprocity, cooperation, unity, peace in genuine diversity. Uh, that are feminist ideals and goals derived from the inclusivity of the gospel message. The final symbol of God is Trinity thus provides women and men and everybody an image and a concept of God that entails qualities that make God truly worthy of imitation, this interdependence of people and, and the fluidity of relationships. We see that uh, coming out strong there. And then the Kugna, you know, so, so, so often uh, when there's a talk of the Trinity, uh, you know, people will, there is, we know that the spirit Ruha is feminine, but she challenges uh, that feminization uh, and the way in which it sometimes is reduced uh, to stereotypical uh, attributes of, of females. She says, the spirit's activities should not be stereotyped according to gender determined roles for women. Further, a trinity that is predominantly two thirds male with one feminine dimension concedes that father and son um, or should be imagined slowly as masculine. According to the subordinist Trinitarian theology, the spirit is third and the association of female imagery solely with the spirit would reinforce the subordination of women in church and society. 
So, so when we are talking about diversity, we start at the core of our faith in understanding who God is and what does that entail in terms of what it means to be made in the image of God, an inclusive image, you know, and, 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 and I think that's where it starts. Um, so, so when we look at the three characteristics that we draw from this inclusive is the sacredness of person. Nothing is more sacred than the person since it constitutes the way of being of God. So when we're talking about the sacredness of the persons, we are saying all people, no one excluded. And so with that kind of theology, that would critique the kind of alienation uh, theology. And then the relatedness, the social nature of persons, that persons cannot exist in isolation because God is not alone, God is communion. Since God exists in communion, human beings are social and communal. So we cannot exclude any member of the human family in the name of God. We are all connected. And, and lastly, the uniqueness of persons, which makes them unrepeatable and irreplaceable. Persons can neither be reproduced nor perpetuated like a species. They cannot be composed or decomposed, combined or used for any objective. So again, the, 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 the critique is to go to the very fundamentals of our faith, disrupt those and make anything uh, that, that violates diversity completely unchristian, really. And, and, and I think we, we have to come to that point. And then even the theology of, of diversity, we see it in creation. Every single species is characterized by difference. There's not just one fish, one vegetable, one bird, one anything. There's no uh, uh, a protocol. Every, the diversity within creation stems from the diversity of who God is. So the oneness of relatedness and interdependence. And so, Everything is related. We as human beings are united. Uh, brothers, sisters, others on a wonderful pilgrimage woven together by the love of God for each of uh, God's creation. Sorry, it's a, a sexist language, but I'm just quoting, which unites us in fond affection with brand, brother, son, sister, moon, brother, river, mother, earth. The earth is essentially a shared inheritance whose fruits are meant to benefit everyone. So, 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 so those are the kind of fundamentals uh, that we have and the, the one bodiness, just as there's one body, every part is connected to Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit. You know, we are given all to the one spirit to drink. Even so the body is not made up of one part, but of all parts. And then we cannot say, if the food says, because I'm not the hand, I do not belong to the body. It will not for any reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. So we're beginning to see from our very fundamentals how unchristian anything that doesn't embrace difference uh, is, starting from the very nature of God. Um, and, and so now we, we, we want to look at what happens when we fail to put our faith into practice when we fail to embrace diversity. And we've heard it from my fellow panelists. That's where sexism comes in, slavery, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and violence in religious texts. The interpretation of religious texts that, that alienate, that exclude, that justify the exclusion. So that's where the violence is. It starts in our faith. And I think we need to acknowledge that. And, and as, as part of the way that we, and for example, in the catechism, when it says that the, the, the homosexual expression is intrinsically evil and disordered, you know, really that is one of the most violent uh, expressions that we, anyone can have, because you are saying that when somebody expresses who they are, it is intrinsically evil. And so there is the only heterosexual people are allowed to express where there is that union. Everyone else created in the image of God is unable to express who they are in ways that affirm their dignity. So we begin to see as we look at the, through the lens of diversity, that anything that, um, that, that marginalizes, that um, uh, creates prejudice is fundamentally opposed to the faith that we hold on to. And, um, I remember pointing that out, I think at the Bishop's Conference here, 
And they were saying, this is the first time we actually understood how violent this text is, because we know that words are so powerful. If we look at any form of violence, it starts with the language in which we package, the way we call people. And so that becomes the seeds. You know, so having that in our catechism doesn't lend itself to love, to inclusion, to, you know, to, you know, to diversity. It means like a, a certain group of people is not, is not allowed to express who they are. So that's where we see the uh, violence. And then the accountability. And we have an example from the Dutch Reformed Church here in South Africa, where they took responsibility uh, for the theologies of apartheid and they apologized. They called apartheid a heresy. And they said that we are aware that this theology has destroyed black bodies, bl brown bodies, and we are declaring it a heresy. And this is what accountability is. It's not just a statement to say, we are now including everybody. It is coming to say that all theologies that have uh, dehumanized women, dehumanized LGBTI, all those theologies are heresy. We need to come to a very clear statement of calling this harmful theological that have harmed people, that have allowed people, and also even the silence. You know, when, 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 when people are attacked because of their gender expression, we are not seeing churches closing down and saying that is in, we are standing up because this person is made in the image of God and any violation is unacceptable. We don't see that kind of uh, rising uh, because underneath are theologies and ways of non-acceptance of diversity. And so here's a real example of a church that came and said, we confess that our theologies are heretical. And we see that also in Laudato Si, where Pope Francis talks about that the theology of domination of the earth should be rejected. So again, this theology of, of, of domination, of marginalizing people because of their gender uh, should also be declared a heresy. And, and, and yeah, so that's, that, that, that's, that's an example I want to leave us with. Um, and then the responsibility for justice making, that there needs to be a, a responsibility to put things right. When you have broken the lives of people through theologies, when certain people have been imaged in ways that are inconsistent with the very fundamentals of our faith, there needs to be putting things right. That is part of justice making. And I want to end with a, um, a, a quotation from Leonardo Boff, who describes a church modeled after the Trinity. Such a church, inspired by the communion of the Trinity, would be characterized by a more equitable sharing of sacred power, so we don't have everything centralized by dialogue, listening, acting, dialogue, by openness to all the charismas granted to the members of the community, by the disappearance of all type of discrimination, especially those uh, originated in patriarchalism, machismo, by its permanent search for a consensus to be built upon through the organized participation of all members. So basically my central argument then is saying that when diversity is denied, the very essence of our faith is denied because in the theology of God is a diverse communion. In the creation is diversity, even amongst humanity. We know that there's diversity of IQ, diversity of eye, eye, eye color, diversity of DNA, diversity of fingerprints, and yet we're not able to, to accept sexual diversity. So it means even in that constraining of diversity, there's also something that needs to be corrected. So I, I, I myself uh, am arguing that the lack of diversity is the biggest heresy because it denies the fundamentals of our faith. Diversity in God, diversity in creation, diversity in humanity, diversity in the, in the church as the body of Christ, and diversity as an expression of the sacredness, the, 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 the value 
of all of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lentando. Um, so many really important points being brought down to the fundamentals, really, of who we are as human beings, you know, and uh, that sense of the plurality, the diversity of who we are. Um, in all that we see all around us in the world, you know, we, we fit into that mosaic of, 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 of the world and, and creation. Um, so thank you very much for that. I appreciate uh, that we are running late, but there are many questions that have come up uh, that um, are going to, that some of them are going to be collated and posed um, by Penelope. Uh, Penelope, am I handing over to you now for the yeah. first question that needs answering? Okay, hello. Yeah. The first question is, why have we left out disability? Um, and I think the best person to answer this is Dave Lucas, who we invited on because we got to know him after we began this um, panel. And he has some very important messages for us all, which we are taking on board. Um, Dave, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Great. Hi, Dave. Hi. I, I think it's because it's the most, the thing that makes us feel most uncomfortable. We look at disabled people and we think, Oh God, that could be me. And it's very, very uncomfortable. The big turning point for me in my journey, um, coming to terms with, with my sight loss and kind of making peace between my sight loss and my faith was realizing that, that the risen Jesus ascended to heaven with his wounds. That was huge for me. We tend to think, you know, People often say as a kind of way of trying to comfort disabled people, oh, but when you get to heaven, that will be gone. What we forget is many disabled people identify as, in the same way that we talk about LGBT people, they identify as disabled. It's been a 30 year journey for me to come to terms with my blindness. And now it is, it defines who I am, it informs my faith. It doesn't get in the way of it, it did. It now informs my faith. So we need to start thinking in, in those kind of terms. And one of the biggest difficulties I think is that the church has confused the difference between healing and cure. I tell people I am healed of my blindness. It no longer is such a big thing for me that it dominates everything. I'm I'm healed of it. I'm not cured of it. I'm still a blind man. But it no longer is the big thing in my life that drags me down. That, that's the difference between healing and cure. And we need to learn that as church. I think, I hope that helps. Thank you very much, Dave. Moving to another question here. The contradiction of the church's teachings on sex and sexuality strikes me every Sunday when I contrast how I and many members of my much loved parish family can quietly ignore the church's teachings on living together and birth control and still be embraced by our church community. Whilst others who move into same sex relationships or are trans quietly disappear from our pews. How on earth can this be ground in which the gospel lives and grows? And I apologize, Ruby, if I cut you off there, please forgive me. No, no, you haven't cut me off at all. Uh, all I was going to say was, um, uh, could, could the, uh, could Nintendo, James and uh, could Charani have your cameras on just so I can see, uh, you know, through body language, who'd like to answer these questions? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, anyone want to jump in and answer that question or shall I, shall I pick someone? Nintendo, would you like to have a go? Yes, and I will also invite my fellow panelists to back me up as well. Okay. Um, I think when we come to sexuality, we know that this has been a struggle for the church to be able to 
reconcile spirituality and sexuality. And so that's why, you know, the, 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 the affirmation of virginity as being uh, the closest uh, status that reflects uh, God and Jesus. So this is a, a problem that has uh, really plagued the church, the inability to embrace sexuality. And we know uh, that it, sexuality in its diversity. Uh, we know that, um, you know, Pope John Paul through the theology of, of the body tried to do something, but it, there wasn't, um, and so even you had this, that's, you know, the op opposition to contraceptives and all of that, or, um, you know, having a suspicion uh, but I think the, now there is an, a, an understanding of sex as being an expression of love. But once again, it's always limited. It's always a particular sexuality that is upheld. All other diversity of sexuality are excluded. You know, so, 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 so there's the kind of privilege. Heteronormativity is very much so aligned with sexuality, that anything else that doesn't fall into that category is um, rejected. It's it's really couched in language uh, that communicates complete rejection of sexual diversity. So I would maybe start there and then hand over to my fellow panelists to beef it up. Well, yeah, well, sadly, beefing up is not going to happen because we're running very, very late. So it's going to have to be one hit wonders at, at answering the questions uh, that come up. So sorry about that. Uh, so we're going to try and pack in as many more questions as we can. So if we can just um, have another question, please. Hello. Yes, we have this question um, really inspired by James. Um, you talk about this, the primacy of a passion for evangelization. James, would you ask every synodal proposal how this will issue, how this will nurture, support the evangelizing mission of the church? So everything that we're coming up with, will it, can it feed into nurturing, supporting and evangelizing the mission of the church? Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. And yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think that one of the really interesting things is I understand that um, Pope Francis's reorganization of the Vatican Curia is in fact going to put evangelization as the uh, locomotive of the train of all the other, um, <laughs> of all the other departments. Um, and I think that we should, be doing, we should be doing the same. The question is, are we making the gospel available in such a way that it can be shared? Uh, and I think that that's that, that's absolutely central going forward. Um, that's yeah, I, I agree totally with the, the the question as it's posed, and I hope that that's going to form our response. Thank you, thank you, James. We got another question. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, this one sa simply says, "Could you recommend a forward-thinking book on prayer?" Anyone got any recommendations? Vicharani, you're smiling. I have stopped reading books on prayer. I'm listening to my own body. I listen to the earth. I listen to conflicts. I listen to, for me, that has become the open book on prayer. You know, I, for me, experience of life speaks of how the spirit is, is um, gasping, is bleeding, is healing. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I have stopped. Maybe feminist spirituality has taken me out of the text to the texture of life. And I find that texture very, very powerful in its language, which connects you to the spirit. So for me, I cannot recommend a book on prayer. So. Anyone got a book to mind that they could quickly recommend before we go on to the next question? No, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, another question, please. Um, what role does hierarchy play? Um, the question is, if hierarchy is diverse, if it could be diverse, would that not be a force for good? You'd like to take that one. Yeah, thank you, Nintendo. 
I think, you know, when we think about hierarchy, it's about inequality. It is about, uh, again, a certain group of people having access to power. Um, and so we find that the same, even if in that hierarchy, you end up having women, um, you'll find like the same patriarchy continues. So the, 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 the idea is to dismantle hierarchy in itself and create a, a communion or redefine it uh, in terms of servanthood. But wh whenever there's power and power is invested in a few people, uh, whether they are male or female or inclusive, it means that other people are going to be left out. Um, so yeah, so maybe to go back to what Jesus said, where he, he, he was the servant who washed the feet uh, of his disciples, uh, a whole new culture. And I think uh, Pope Francis talks about clericalism to dismantle that so that even the very essence of leadership is not what we used to. It's more servant and it's more egalitarian and it's more communal. You know, I think of African traditional religions, they don't have, uh, for example, uh, Moses or, or somebody who is leading because they're communal. You know, where the community comes together, creates consensus, creates a collective. Um, and I think we can try to find a, a model that doesn't invest power in a few people. Thank you. Thank you, Lintando. Uh, we got time for another question or two? Okay, thank you. One more. Okay. Right, thank you. Mary? Um, just coming through, sorry, scrolling. We, we've got so many questions. What a shame we can't ask them all. Um, this person says, I know that from personal experience, pre-puberty at 16 years, I was happy in trousers and short hair, comfortable shoes, but relieved that I was able to be just myself in a girls' convent school where I had to wear a skirt and dress. However, I found that I grew into my female gender post-puberty and no wish to be trans, but I'm still comfortable with trousers, short hair, and ha happily married with daughters. But she says, I feel uncomfortable pressures to change gender at an early age. I don't know if anyone would like to pick that one up. Claire, yes. Yeah, your microphone is off, Claire. Thank you. Um, I'm becoming increasingly aware that in schools, um, uh, there seems to be increasing numbers of girls um, kind of questioning their gender. And I'm sure that must be obvious, really, uh, related to patriarchy and the celebrity culture that we're embroiled in, and of course permeates totally the internet. Um, yeah, it's it's outside forces, and I don't think I'm, young people um, are able to grasp them, but they. They want to protest against them in a sense and dress, you know, one's identity is often um, shown through the mode of dress that we uh, adopt in many ways. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think there's. Um, I'm sniffing a little bit um, of, you know, uh, how can I put it? The cultural debate around trans issues, um, you know, some people, it's very polarized um, and it doesn't take us forward at all, really. No, no, no. We're, we're, these, like today's events, uh, give us a, a, a safe forum in which to explore issues rather than take, you know, opinionated one liners, say, on Twitter or, or, um, yeah, yeah, that do. Thank you, Claire. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, yes, Penelope. Oh, microphone's off. I'm not sure if this is Penelope. Oh, it's for you, Mary. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, one last question then. Where is the voice of the poor? 
or the working classes in all these synod deliberations. Who'd like to take that one? Nintendo, you gonna have a go? It's just you're in the middle of yeah. my screen and you've got this big smile <laughs> no, on your no. face. <laughs> so. um, yeah, I, I think really what we are seeing is um, the digital divide. And we have seen that coming with COVID in all areas of life from education, uh, where the digital divide has become the next uh, area of exclusion. Um, and so there needs to be an intentionality uh, to be able to make, uh, to give access to all people as a human right. Uh, because as long as we are communicating uh, via the, 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 the Zoom or, or any of these uh, excesses, it means we will exclude the poor. And so therefore that question uh, causes us to say the next struggle is the digital divide. Okay, I, I think we're going to have to stop. We've run over time. I, I do apologize uh, for all <laughs> you sent in all your questions. It's just not important. It's just impossible to 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 deal with all of them. Um, however, uh, let me first of all say thank you to all of you who have attended uh, and have been watching it uh, on our YouTube channel, and most importantly, thank all the panelists uh, for all the hard work they've done, the planning and the preparation for their presentation. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, so tomorrow we have the Moral Theology panel um, at 7 o'clock, British Standard Time. Um, um, and then we, uh, on Wednesday, we have a Sharing Authority at 6.30 British Standard Time. Um, and just to say that um, the, uh, the slides will be on the website, uh, as will the recording of yesterday and, and today's panel uh, discussion, the presentation, as you say. So they're all there. And uh, well, all I can say once again is thank you very much for attending. And we look forward to you joining us tomorrow and the next day, and hopefully in person in Bristol. So uh, thank you, one, and thank you all. Uh, did I get the timing wrong? Yes, 4.30, I beg your pardon. I, I can't read. <laughs> 24 hour clocks, I'm so sorry, 4.30, not 6.30 uh, on Wednesday. Uh, so once again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Penelope, and thank you, Mary, for assisting. Thank you, most importantly, to Kucharani, Nintendo, James, and Claire. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you so much, Ruby. We, we, we've spent all year closing our meetings with this very simple prayer entitled God's Dream by Charles Peggy. And so if this can be seen on the screen, um, do, do, can you see the Charles Peggy prayer, Ruby? That's lovely. And so perhaps we can read this quietly together. I myself will dream a dream within you. Good dreams come from me, you know. My dreams seem impossible, not too practical, not for the cautious man or woman, a little risky sometimes, a trifle brash perhaps. Some of my friends prefer to rest more comfortably in sound asleep with visionless eyes. But from those who share my dreams, I ask a little patience, a little humor, some small courage and a listening heart. I will do the rest. Then they will risk and wonder at their daring, run and marvel at their speed, build and stand in awe at the beauty of their building. You will meet me often as you work, in your companions who share the risk, in your friends who believe in you enough to lend their own hands, their own hearts to your building. In the people who will stand in your doorway, stay a while and walk away, knowing they too can find a dream. There will be sun filled days and sometimes it will rain. A little variety, both come from me. 
So come now, be content. It is my dream you dream, my house you build, my caring you witness, my love you share, and this is the heart of the matter. Thank you, everybody. Um, God bless and see you wherever and whenever. Take good care. Bye-bye.